Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. Today we're going to do another ship comparison video. This time, the Dunkirk class uh, fast battleships, treaty battleships, some say battle cruisers or cruiser killers. Uh, but these were some of the first capital ships built under the uh, Washington and London Naval Treaties during the interwar period, and uh, their designs led to a number of other designs uh, later on, and many of which we've already covered. And in a couple of videos, such as the Alaska-class battle cruisers and the uh, Scharnhorst-class battleships, uh, we've talked about their, uh, their design as being involved in the design of those later ships. So, France, uh, much like Italy, who you'll see weave in and out of this story, uh, ended World War I with some fairly old first-generation dreadnoughts. Uh, their later generation dreadnoughts were not completed before the end of the war, and they were not completed in the uh, interwar period. So I'm talking about classes like uh, Normandy, uh, which would have been a more modern type of dreadnought battleship. So, uh, being deficient in capital ships, France and Italy were each allotted about 70,000 tons of displacement under the Washington Naval Treaty to uh, start building new capital ships in the 1920s and uh, early 30s. Uh, following World War I, neither country had a lot of money, and uh, both wanted to see what other nations were doing. Uh, so both sides laid down some pretty decent treaty-heavy cruisers. Uh, and under the Washington Naval Treaty, while the size of heavy cruisers was limited, the number uh, was not so much limited the way battleships were. So uh, countries started to build a lot of these uh, treaty cruisers, and they were fairly powerful. Uh, even though they were limited to 10,000 tons displacement and 8-inch guns, uh, they far outclassed the older cruisers in the fleets. So, the French had a dilemma. They could build two battleships to maximum tree specifications, 35,000 tons, uh, or they could build as many as uh, four 17,500 ton battleships, uh, or they could build three battleships around uh, 24,000 tons each. And uh, they had to decide which option they wanted to go with. So there were a number of design studies in the late 20s and early 30s, uh, and a number of competing theories. Uh, and uh, more or less, they just kept getting delayed, primarily because they wanted to see, well, what's Italy going to lay down? What's uh, Germany going to lay down? What's, what's Great Britain building? What, what else is out there? Uh, and in the end, the, uh, the French blinked first and uh, laid down their ships. So uh, a 17,500 ton design would have been probably limited to about 12 inch guns, which is on the small side for a capital ship, would have had cruiser speed and uh, may have been able to have armor to protect it against eight inch treaty cruiser guns. And again, you could have four of them. So you can patrol uh, all over the place and uh, hunt down enemy cruisers. Uh, and, and this, the codification of the size of cruisers by the Washington Naval Treaty leads to a number of um, designs which I call cruiser killers. Some people call ships designed to hunt down these cruisers battle cruisers uh, during World War I. The ships designed to hunt down armored cruisers were battle cruisers. At that time, battle cruisers were every bit the displacement and uh, firepower of a comparable dreadnought, and the cost as well. Um, however, treaty cruiser killers tend to be about halfway between the cost, firepower, and weight of a battleship and a cruiser. 
So I don't think it's quite the same. I think these designs uh, need their own uh, terminology, and I, I believe Cruiser Killer is the best design for it. They can't stand in line of battle against battleships the way World War I battle cruisers were used. Uh, and so I would say that uh, ships like Dunkirk and Strasbourg, uh, ships like the American Alaska and Guam, uh, ships like the Japanese B-65 that was never built, or the uh, Dutch uh, 1066 design that was designed to operate in the East Indies. Uh, these are all somewhere between a full-size battleship and a cruiser. Uh, so I call those all cruiser killers, and there weren't many actually built. But as you read sources, uh, especially about Dunkirk and Strasbourg, you, you may see some people call them battleships, some people call them battle cruisers. So uh, the lighter 17,500 ton design, you could build a lot of them and cover a lot of ground, but it was really too light and you couldn't armor them against anything bigger than eight inches. Uh, the larger 35,000 ton design could have been a uh, pretty large capital ship. The, the French were looking at arming it with six 16 inch guns. Uh, there was fast and slow designs as always, but the, the fast designs could be as much as 30 knots uh, and uh, probably couldn't armor it against 16 inch guns, but they could armor it against anything smaller. Uh, but you could only build two of those ships. Uh, at this point, the French hand is tipped. Germany releases the Deutschland-class armored cruisers, or pocket battleships, or heavy cruisers. Uh, again, a lot of names uh, associated here. Germany was not a signatory of the Washington Naval Treaty. They were held to the Treaty of Versailles. The Treaty of Versailles uh, limited them to 10,000 tons displacement, but unlike the Washington Naval Treaty, which created a standard displacement limit, uh, the Treaty of Versailles used different measurements. So in actuality, uh, the pocket battleships were about 12,000 tons standard displacement. They were armed with six 11-inch guns, and they used diesel power, so they had incredibly long range, um, were more or less armored against 8-inch shells, uh, and it had a speed of about 26 knots in theory, although they could go a little bit faster. So they were lighter than or slower than cruisers, faster than almost any capital ship. Um, but they could really shoot cruisers to pieces with their 11-inch guns. And so that demanded a response. France was worried about their commerce. Uh, France at this time was still the center of a um, colonial empire with uh, metropolitan France in Europe and then colonies uh, in the Pacific, in the Caribbean, and uh, the most prominent of which in French North Africa. Uh, so a German cruiser raiding force could, in theory, do a lot of damage to French commerce. Uh, so the French started looking at these ships as commerce protection. The only ships that could run down and outgun the pocket battleships were the British and Japanese uh, battle cruisers. So France started looking at a ship with 30 knot speed and armor that could protect them against 11 inch guns, not just 8 inch guns, but 11 inch guns. So this threw out the uh, 17,500 ton option. Uh, and at 35,000 tons, that would really be overkill. And uh, you, you'd only get two of those ships. So they threw out that option. Uh, and they started designing a ship about 24, 25,000 tons standard displacement. And they could build two or, or three of these vessels and uh, get some protection for their, for their commerce. Well, if they start building uh, these ships, and then Italy finally plays their hand and lays down a couple of 35,000 ton 15-inch armed battleships. 
Um, so those could easily defeat these friendships, and in the end, only two, uh, the two that had already been laid down, Dunkirk and Strasbourg, were completed. And a, another design, what would become the Reichelieu class uh, battleships at 35,000 tons, was proposed for future French capital ships. And we've got another video on Reichelieu. Check that out. So, um, the design for the Dunkirk and Strasbourg are more or less finalized. Um, and the final player in the game is the uh, German Scheunhorst and Eisenau, which are built to 35,000 tons with nine 11-inch guns uh, and some really thick 13-inch armor. Uh, and they are designed, they started their life as pocket battleships, but then with uh, Dunkirk and Strasbourg under construction, it was decided to increase the size themselves and uh, make them able to compete with Dunkirk and Strasbourg. Uh, and in the end, the Germans came up with a ship that was about 10,000 tons heavier. Uh, but in other respects, it remained a fair fight. We'll talk more about how Dunkirk compares to uh, other European battleships in a minute. So, uh, the ships ended up being about 706 feet overall, although Strasbourg is a little longer than Dunkirk and a little heavier and has slightly thicker armor. Uh, the numbers I'm using are more of Dunkirk's numbers. They were 102 feet wide, uh, so these vessels are about 185 feet shorter than New Jersey uh, and 6 feet narrower. They only drew 32 feet of water at full load. Uh, so they're about six feet shallower. Uh, they were designed to displace 26,500 tons. Like I said, they started with about 25,000 tons, and I couldn't get everything they wanted. Uh, so then they went to 26, and I still couldn't get it. So they went to 26.5, uh, and that ended up being about 30,000 tons normal displacement and about 35,000 tons fully loaded for combat. Uh, so these ships are significantly smaller than any other treaty battleship. Uh, and that puts them at a severe disadvantage against a full-size battleship. They had about 1,300 crew, so they are uh, significantly cheaper to man. They, they only had about half of the crew of an Iowa-class battleship. Uh, they carried three aircraft and had a hangar for them. Uh, so they did have a lot of scouting capabilities built in. And so these ships didn't have to operate with cruisers, although France had uh, some, some very good treaty cruisers they were able to break up their cruiser killers and their cruisers to form multiple hunting groups to go out after enemy commerce raiders. Uh, let's see, these ships could make about 30 knots. They uh, had a range of a little under 8,000 nautical miles at about 15 knots. Uh, so that's pretty reasonable for a uh, an Atlantic or a European uh, operating ship, especially given that these ships uh, were designed to operate in the Mediterranean, in part, uh, against the Italians. Uh, and so with that range, they, they really had more range than their Italian counterparts. They were armed with eight 13-inch guns. These guns were in two quadruple turrets, which were located up forward. Now notice that the turrets are sort of offset, so a single hit can't knock out both. Uh, the turrets had an armored bulkhead down the center, so essentially they had they were two twin turrets thrown side by side and sat in the same barbette. They were given an all-forward battery because they were designed to chase down heavy cruisers. That's where the design process started. Uh, and so having all the guns on the front works out fine for that. Uh, and, and this design concept is very heavily influenced by the British Nelson class, uh, which check out this video on Nelson. Uh, their 13-inch guns were pretty good. They fired shells only about half as heavy as New Jersey with her 16-inch shells. They had a fairly large bursting charge, though, uh, and um, they were high caliber, high velocity, 
uh, and they could fire fairly flat trajectories. This meant they were not good at penetrating uh, deck armor. Uh, th this French 13-inch gun and the American 16-inch gun on New Jersey have about the same range, a little over 40,000 uh, yards. Um, so even though it's a smaller shell, it's got comparable range because of its high velocity. The issue is the flat trajectory. So it's almost always hitting ships on the side. The belt tends to be much thicker. Uh, the American shells with their relatively low velocity tend to get a lot of hang time and then drop on the target or they can go through the thin deck armor. Um, so it's kind of a wash on which was more effective. The longest range shot ever landed in history was only uh, about 13 nautical miles. So even though this ship, New Jersey, Dunkirk, they all had ranges over 20 miles, they never hit another ship at that range. Um, the French shell was sufficient to penetrate most battleship armor in the world uh, at medium or short ranges. At long range, again, they probably weren't going to get the, uh, the trajectory and they didn't have the terminal velocity. Um, but if they could get to medium range, they could punch through Scharnhorst's armor. Uh, they could probably punch through New Jersey's belt armor, which is relatively thin, all things considered. Um, but by the same token, these ships can also punch through their belt armor. Uh, for a secondary battery, they were armed with 16 5-inch guns. These were the first dual-purpose guns in the French Navy, uh, and they had a kind of slow rate of fire. Some of the guns were mounted in quadruple turrets back aft to cover the arc of fire that the 13-inch uh, guns couldn't. And uh, when you put four five-inch gun barrels in one mount, uh, it becomes very tight for manually loading those weapons. Uh, so their rate of fire wasn't nearly as good as the Americans with their twin mount guns. Uh, some of the turrets were twin mount. Uh, all in all, th this was the first attempt at a dual-purpose weapon, and it wasn't that great. It, it was fine by early 30s standards, but by World War II, uh, especially going into World War II, it wouldn't have done much good as an anti-aircraft weapon. Uh, they had 10 37mm guns, uh, which again, is pretty good for when they were built and in even early war, but uh, fairly deficient by late war. And they had uh, 32 uh, 50 caliber guns in quadruple mounts. Uh, and again, uh, the, the 50 cal proved to be too short a range and too little stopping power against modern um, aircraft during World War II. Putting four of them together uh, sort of helps with the stopping power, but it means you can engage fewer targets. Uh, so again, uh, these ships, decent anti-aircraft battery for 1939 uh, for the European theater doesn't, cannot compare at all to something like uh, the New Jersey. Uh, she had a nine inch belt. That's uh, fairly light. Can't even really stop her own shells at uh, many ranges. But it can stop cruiser gunfire, which is where this design started. Interestingly, her nine inch belt was backed by two and a half inches of teak wood. This was designed to absorb a lot of the, the impact of something going through the armored belt and to catch the spalling, the, uh, any shrapnel created by the armored belt being broken. It is uh, fairly archaic. It, a lot of early pre-dreadnought type battleships had teak wood backing their armor. Uh, much like early ironclads had wood backing their armor. By the time you get modern steel ships, that stops being as much of a thing. I believe that this was in part uh, to fill a void space with something that wouldn't allow water in. Uh, 
which is a deficiency in New Jersey's design. Uh, New Jersey uses a layered armor system with an internal belt. So a shell has to punch through a lot of steel before it gets through the armor. Uh, however, even though, say, a five inch shell from a destroyer can't punch through our belt, it will punch through our shell plating, the exterior hull, uh, and create a bunch of five inch holes there, which will let water into the ship into void spaces. Uh, so even though the critical inside part of the ship is not penetrated, uh, these void spaces can start to flood and damage the ship's buoyancy, reduce your speed, uh, create all sorts of other damage, even uh, create fuel leaks. Uh, so the French might be trying something new here. We'll see they have another uh, technology that they're that they're using uh, to try and keep their their buoyancy. Uh, she had a five inch deck with an uh, inch and a half deck below that. So that's almost comparable to, to what New Jersey has. That's uh, pretty good long range armor on these ships. Uh, because the magazines are concentrated up forward, the heaviest armor is also all concentrated there. So over their engineering spaces and over other parts of the ship, it isn't quite that thick. It's, it's a relatively small area that has that uh, thick armor. But at long range, they, they can tank some hits with that. Uh, their turrets, thickest armor is 13 inches on the face plate, sits in 12 inch barbettes. So, comparable, it, it can stop a 13 inch shell or a German 11 inch shell, such as the Scharnhorst or the pocket battleships had. Uh, but it can't stop true capital ships like the Italian or German 15 inch armed ships. And they had a 10.5 inch conning tower. Uh, which again, it'll stop cruiser gunfire, but not battleship. Many nations were starting to look at removing the conning tower, uh, and honestly, for something this light but this much weight, it might have been better to just have nothing as opposed to uh, something partially functional. Their torpedo protection wasn't too bad. Uh, they had three layers of steel, which isn't much when you compare it to, say, the Isle with, with a, a five-layer defense, but it's pretty good by European standards, especially in the early 30s when these were being designed, uh, and it's got a depth of up to 25 feet, which is a pretty good depth. And, and really, studies showed after the war that uh, the depth of the torpedo defense was more effective than what comprised it, uh, whether it was a complex cylinder system or something like a system of voids and liquid loaded spaces like the U.S. Navy used. Um, while that modified your ship's torpedo defense, it, it was really the depth that bought you uh, good torpedo defense. So at 25 feet thick, that's pretty solid. And some of the void spaces were filled with like a black rubber compound, which again would absorb shrapnel, uh, absorb the explosion, and if the space is filled with rubber, it cannot flood with water. So, uh, and rubber, of course, of course, is buoyant. So that's an interesting design. I'm kind of surprised we don't see uh, hydrophobic materials like that used in the torpedo defenses of more vessels. Uh, one shortcoming I could see with it is uh, any moisture that gets in between the rubber and the steel, and, and there will be moisture, whether it's from condensation or leaks or other stuff getting in there, uh, will cause your steel to corrode faster. Uh, ended up not being an issue with these ships. They, they didn't have particularly long service lives, unfortunately. Um, and really for the expected service life of a warship, which at this time is about 20 years, it's, it's not a major issue. It may have complicated repairs. Uh, but for one of your capital ships, you can afford the, the expense of uh, repairing it. Uh, so for service lives, these ships bounced around a lot. The larger Richelieu and Jean Bart uh, and other ships of that class were not really fully completed at the beginning of the war. Uh, Richelieu had just completed Jean Bart was still under construction, and other ships 
uh, either hadn't been laid down or weren't significantly far along in the process. Uh, so Dunkirk and Strasbourg were really the, the only fully worked up and trained and equipped uh, modern capital ships in the French Navy. They started the war in the Atlantic, um, searching for German commerce raiders. Uh, they were not lucky in that, that they didn't manage to find any. Uh, however, they were just one of many uh, British and French, and in some cases combined British and French forces that were out looking for German commerce raiders, uh, some of which got lucky and, and others of which did not. So they just happened to not be lucky. Had they found German commerce raiders, they would have won that fight. Uh, if it was against the pocket battleships, it would have been a fair fight. If Dunkirk and Strasbourg had come across Scharnhorst and Eisenau, uh, that would have been a relatively fair fight too, even though the Germans put more materials into their ships. Uh, basically, both sides' guns could defeat the other side's armor. So it's a matter of who hits first and uh, who gets more shots. And the speeds are comparable. Uh, secondary battery is fairly comparable. The German ships don't have dual-purpose guns, so they spend more weight on theirs, which gives them more barrels, but uh, their six-inch guns are pretty good. Their, their four-inch guns probably wouldn't be able to penetrate much armor on the French ships. Um, so that, that would have been a relatively fair fight, I think. Um, well, in some instances, these ships were split up, in other instances, they operated together. Um, on at least one occasion, Dunkirk operated with the uh, British fast battleship Hood, searching for enemy commerce raiders. They, they had the speed to go out there and go with basically any force, cruisers, battle cruisers, fast battleships. Uh, they, they could do almost any job. They were, they were good, medium-sized capital ships. They could do a lot of flex work. Uh, and they end up getting sh shifted around a lot because of this. As Italy... Uh, begins to look like they're going to enter the war in 1940. These two ships are pulled out of the Atlantic and moved to North Africa. So unfortunately, this means they were not available for the Norwegian campaign, uh, where Schornhorst and Neisenau uh, came out and uh, were caught by the British battle cruiser Renau. Um, if Dunkirk and Strasbourg had been there, might have been able to add to the Allied calls, but they were stuck... Uh, in the Mediterranean, trying to deter Italy from entering the war. Uh, in the end, Italy enters the war. Germany takes over France way quicker than expected. And uh, the French fleet is mostly interred in North Africa. Uh, and the Germans want it more or less demilitarized. The British don't know what's going on. They are suddenly terrified that... Uh, Great Britain could have defeated Germany and Italy's navies on their own. But if Germany gets the French fleet, uh, well now the French and Italian navies combined in the Mediterranean can easily uh, brush the English out of the way. So they have to move fast to prevent this from happening. Uh, and uh, their solution is to send a fleet, including the aircraft carrier Ark Royal, the battle cruiser Hood, uh, and some older dreadnought-type battleships armed with 15-inch guns, to uh, blockade the port of Mirz el Kabir, where uh, much of the French fleet is docked. Uh, and we'll probably do a separate video all on this battle because it's it's a, a real interesting uh, battle. But uh, it all boils down to. France and England had not fired a shot on each other in over a hundred years. After the Napoleonic Wars, they were pretty well allied. Um, and they had been allies throughout most of World War II, and now the British are worried the French are going to be turned over, so they send this fleet there, and they deliver an ultimatum to the French. They have to demilitarize their ships or sail them to a neutral port or a British port where they can be demilitarized. They can't fall into the German hands. The well, French admiral there kind of vacillates and, and uh, isn't willing to make the decision on his own. Uh, it really is above his pay grade. And uh, he expects German retribution if he just hands these ships over to the British. Uh, so at the end of the day, the British open fire on the French fleet. Uh, 
while they're still in port and unable to defend themselves. In fact, Dunkirk and Strasbourg were nose in to the pier, which uh, meant that their entire main battery was pointing towards land and not towards sea where the British were attacking from, so they couldn't fire back. Uh, and Dunkirk took a number of 15-inch shells from Hood and the battleships, which defeated her armor. And uh, Strasbourg, however, was able to back out, get underway, and escape, uh, and, and make it back to Toulon in France. Uh, Dunkirk was being patched up to go back to Toulon for uh, more yard work, and then uh, aircraft from the Ark Royal came over and launched a torpedo attack on her. They missed Dunkirk, but they hit a uh, small escort ship tied up next to her that was loaded with depth charges. Uh, depth charges, which had the equivalent explosives of about eight torpedoes. So even though she had a really great torpedo defense system, eight torpedoes exploding in one place, basically, will defeat any system. It'll defeat New Jersey's system. Piece of cake. No question there. Uh, so Dunkirk took significant damage from that. Uh, they managed to patch up the holes they sent her to Toulon. Uh, so Dunkirk and Strasbourg are there, and uh, then in 1942, the Allies invade North Africa. Well, the Germans are worried that the French are going to switch sides and help the Allies. So they launch Operation Anton, and uh, basically, France had been partitioned, and the coast was controlled by Nazi Germany, but the interior, and including the Mediterranean coast, uh, was controlled by Vichy France. Well, Operation Anton, the Germans come in and they take over the whole thing. Uh, and they send their tanks into Toulon to try and capture uh, Dunkirk and Strasbourg. Uh, the, the French crews of these ships get some idea of what's going on, so they scuttle their ships. Uh, Strasbourg, which is still sitting in the water, they manage to uh, put detonate. Uh, scuttling charges on her sea chests and blow holes in the bottom of the ship so she sinks right there. Uh, and then they destroy things like gyro compasses, boilers, and range finders, uh, and uh, detonate explosives inside of their gun barrels so that these ships are really not useful. Uh, Dunkirk was in dry dock at the time, still getting repairs, and uh, they basically flooded the dry dock she was sitting in, so it flooded the ship. Uh, so, Afterwards, things go back to normal, and uh, Vichy France is allowed to operate the ships again, so they start to try and make repairs so that maybe post-war they can add these ships to the Navy. Uh, well, then the invasion of France happens, and the Germans give the entire French fleet to the Italians. Uh, and the Italians don't want the French to use these ships again, so they go through and they damage them more. Well. Then the Americans are planning on Operation Dragoon, the invasion of southern France following the D-Day landings, and uh, they see these two French battleships in port, and they bomb them again repeatedly. So by the time the war is over, there isn't a whole heck of a lot uh, left intact on these vessels, and by the, uh, the mid-1950s, they, they both get scrapped. Uh, there really is no comparison between these early treaty battleships and New Jersey. They're, they're just so much smaller. They're slower, they have less armor, they have less firepower, they have less anti-aircraft, they're, they're less modern, they don't have the same electronics. Uh, there, there is no real comparison there. They would have done fine against older battleships in a fair fight. They would have done fine against uh, some of the earliest treaty era ships like Sean Horst and Eisenhower and the pocket battleships. They would have done fine with their intended job of hunting down cruisers if they could have come to blows with any. But against the true 35,000 ton treaty battleship, um, they were sorely deficient. Uh, and being caught in port, they were sorely deficient. Against aircraft, they were sorely deficient. Everything they faced, uh, they, they were not equipped to handle, unfortunately. However, like I said earlier, this was the first design uh, 
following Nelson and Rodney after the uh, naval treaty system started. So a lot of people were waiting to see what would happen and based their designs off of these ships. So this was the starting point um, where then you see, all right, in order to beat these ships, we've got to build 35,000 ton ships, Latorio or Scharnhorst. Uh, and then the French had to respond with Richelieu and the British with the King George V and then the Germans with Bismarck. Uh, and, uh, and that basically gets us to the end of European battleship construction. The British put out Vanguard, uh, which is roughly equivalent to any of the earlier ones. And that's, that's that. Anyway, thanks for watching today. Um, if you have any questions or comments about Dunkirk class battleships or other ships you would like to see in future comparison videos, leave them in the description down below. Love to start a conversation there. Uh, if you would like to support the museum and our YouTube channel, check the description down below. There are links there to some of the other videos I talked about. There is also uh, a link to our GoFundMe campaign, which we're using to pay for uh, the costs of creating these YouTube videos several times a week. And remember, because we are creating content several times a week, like, share, and subscribe so that you're notified when we put out more stuff. See you next time.